Tonight on EWTN Live, we'll talk about the effect the first Jesuit Pope from the Americas is having on the church and the world. So please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live. I'm um, afraid I've had a little bit of laryngitis uh, over the last couple of days, uh, maybe a little curlygitis and mojitis too, but the doctor took care of it, and so I'm doing somewhat better tonight. Uh, so, uh, God willing, we'll get through this all right. Now, we have a couple of guests tonight who are endeavoring to bring us a more up-close and personal understanding of Pope Francis in a variety of ways, one of which takes the form of a new book of personal reflections about the man who became Pope called Pope Francis, Our Brother, Our Friend. Also, you can catch a new documentary on Pope Francis produced by the Knights of Columbus titled Francis, Pope from the New World which will premiere tonight on EWTN at 9.30 Eastern Time. Take a quick little look at a clip from that. And I'd be sitting here Hello, Father, I'd say. And I would get down and greet him. Before leaving, the last thing he always said was, pray for me, hallelujah. He always said, pray for me. He has always been the same, worried about the problems of humankind, the injustices and the poverty. He walked through the neighborhoods of Buenos Aires and San Miguel. He walked everywhere, and he knew and loved the people, and they loved him very much. The fact is, he was always a person that liked to learn about reality by living it. You would always run into him in the neighborhoods. He was never a desk priest. For me, he was very down-to-earth and normal because I would travel with him in the subway. I would speak with him and he would come to our parish. We would go walking in the streets together. He was our priest. He was one of the priests of our neighborhood, the priest of the Via. In truth, it pains me to have lost him. If we needed something, we would call him. Bergoglio would always lend a hand. Bergoglio is always listening. Thank you. And please welcome our guests, Andrew Walter and Alejandro Bermudez. Good to see you, Andrew. Alejandro. And so, folks are clear. Alejandro, you wrote the book on Pope Francis, our brother, our friend. And uh, Andrew, you were in charge of making this video. Uh, were you also part of going down to Latin America to do it? Well, yeah, actually, we had quite a team that was working on this documentary um, yeah. from the Knights of Columbus, and also Alejandro was one of the executive producers of it Great. as well. We both went down there for this project, along with several members of our team, and uh, our director and producers went down as well, and really tried to get to know who Pope Francis was in terms of who was this man who came from Buenos Aires and became Pope. Right. You know, and we, we've certainly had... Uh, uh, some difficulties because uh, I was watching a news broadcast and Bernard Goldberg, who himself had been a 
broadcast reporter for a number of years, did a segment yesterday, uh, day or two ago, saying that the uh, mainstream media is trying to filter Pope Francis to suit some of their own political philosophical agenda. So for instance, he just came out strongly, strongly against abortion and nothing except that it was mentioned on this show, uh, but other shows did not mention it. And well, all the things that he says, they take out of context and so on. So, I, and having watched the video you did, I saw how important it was to gain that context, which we are not getting from most of the mainstream media. How did you find it yourself? Well, I think that there is a great consistency to Jorge Mario Bergoglio and Pope Francis that, that this man has a very long track record. Mm -hmm. And you see this both in the interviews in Alejandro's book and also in the documentary and in the, the two books of interviews that Pope Francis has published under his name, uh, the book by Sergio Rubin and the book he co-authored with Rabbi Skorka. You see over and over again that he deals with the same themes in the same way, and he's doing, he's doing this again as Pope. Now, speaking out on an issue like abortion the other day would be at least the third time in this pontificate that he's yes. done that. He went to the March for Life, he spoke to the gynecologist meeting, now this, there, I'm sure there have been other times as well. It, the, the fact of the matter is that, that the Pope is very consistent in what he says, and I think if people want to know who he is and what he thinks, they need to go to his words, to what he said, yes. and, and I think the, the books that he's written, the book that Alejandro's written, this documentary, can all help people get some context for who Pope Francis is. And, and again, uh, by seeing what he actually says, uh, I was interviewed on a secular network once, and they said, well, don't you think that the Pope's most recent statement has just contradicted Pope Benedict? And they were all excited. And I said, have you read Pope Francis' words? We'll call you back. <laughs> and they hadn't. It didn't occur to them. And so this is one of the things that's extremely important. And Alejandro, how did you do this book? It's, it's interviews and such. How did you get that done? Well, it was actually originally the idea of, uh, of uh, one of our brother Jesuits, Father Joe Fessio. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, um, uh, he, he had the same feeling that, that uh, um, Andrew and I experienced when we were in Rome during the election of the Pope. Mm -hmm. Pope comes out, everybody hears the announcement, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, and all my colleagues on their uh, own uh, uh, TV booths go totally silent. They, they had no idea of what to say. I was covering for EWTN in Spanish at that time. I've been blessed as a Catholic journalist to know F uh, uh, Pope Francis when he was Archbishop of Bergoglio. So I have a little bit to say, but we immediately realized we need to introduce uh, this, this wonderful man mm -hmm. to the Catholic community in one hand and to the rest of the world in the other hand. So do a little bit of background story and so forth. Right. Uh, Father, Father Fessio said, why don't you go and interview as many of his brother Jesuits that you can find? We found a good number of, of, of Jesuits uh, in Argentina, but also another significant number of people that had been very close to him that were not Jesuits. So that's, sure. that's, that was the, 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 the origin of the name. Francis, our brother, meaning the 10 Jesuits that are interviewed in the, in the, in the book, mm -hmm. our friend, meaning the other 10 people who are not priests or not, not Jesuits, a lot of them, you know, people from all walks of life that have had a, a, a close relationship with him. So at the end of the day, I think it brings out a mosaic that shows the, um, the as, as Andrew said, number one, the consistency of this, of this man from being a priest to all the way becoming a pope, and number two, the 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 uh, the, the complexity 
of his uh, of his personality to the point that I would I would uh, dare to say that uh, there is a lot of things that we will still discover from him in the future. Yes, you know, uh, did you cross fertilize here by having some of the same people interviewed in the book as in the uh, video? Yes, I think there's some overlap. Okay. I mean, going going down to Argentina, we had a great number of people that we wanted to interview. Sure. Some of the interviews, I think, are exclusive to the book, or mm -hmm. um, and so on. But but I think some of them, I, I don't. Uh, I it, it made a lot of sense to turn the cameras on while we were interviewing, and and obviously in a documentary, you can only use a certain amount of an interview, and in the book, a great deal more could be used. Yes, exactly. Now there were a number of points in the uh, video that uh, I, I think would be good to touch on. Uh, one, uh, he was consistently apolitical and consistently disliked by very different political sides. You know, that, 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 that was uh, fairly obvious as you go through. He, he did not support the right or the left. He urged the Jesuits when he was provincial not to do left-wing politics or right-wing politics for that matter, uh, but to be priests, you know, consistent with that. Uh, and uh, both sides disliked him as a result. Uh, address that a little bit. Well, he, he says in the book that he co-authored with Rabbi Skorka, um, on heaven and earth, he he says in there that that his he didn't see his job as as dealing with politics with a capital P, but rather as dealing with politics with a small P, meaning, you know, issues of morality, general issues, and preaching on those issues, realizing that in preaching on those issues, different constituencies would find certain elements of it attractive or certain elements of it unattractive, but his job was to to present the truth. Mm -hmm. There is quite a bit in the documentary about the fact that he did, in fact, remain very neutral, especially during the Dirty War. I mean, he helped people to escape when the government was hunting them down. At the same time, he tried to call back. And that, the, that was a military kind of right-wing government at that time. There was a military junta. There were there were Marxist guerrillas. There right. was a you know, a sort of a low-grade civil war kind of conflict. And he steered a very steady course and didn't entangle the order or himself in the politics of either side. Right. As a matter of fact, I want to take a look at a little section of that because you deal with the dirty war in the documentary. And I'd like to have a, a little look at what a tough time that was from, as you describe it there. It was a difficult time, because in 1973, we had four presidents. In 1976, the military took over the government. So Bergoglio was the provincial during one of the most difficult periods in the history of Argentina. Bergoglio was also challenged by changes within the church. A growing number of priests and theologians in Latin America began to see liberation through political, economic, and social revolution. In its most extreme interpretation, liberation theology served to justify guerrilla movements with Marxist revolutionary ideas. Bergoglio guided his priests away from politics and confrontation. Nevertheless, political violence sometimes struck too close to home. The new military dictatorship under General Videla was opposed by Marxist guerrilla groups and labor unions. The junta set out to ruthlessly eliminate its enemies. The ensuing violence became known as the Dirty War and tore the nation apart. Horacio Verbitsky claimed that during the 1976 kidnapping of two Jesuit priests, Bergoglio turned a blind eye since he disagreed with their political involvement. They couldn't accept the rules that Bergoglio set as a superior. 
they had to leave the area where they were staying because he could not guarantee their safety in the face of the many dangers involving the kidnappings of people during the military dictatorship. But they did not agree, and they decided to leave the Society of Jesus, to stop being Jesuits, and continue their pastoral and political activities. Shortly after, they were kidnapped by the military forces and were imprisoned and tortured. Bergoglio got the chaplain who served the dictator to call in sick so that he could go to see the dictator himself and personally appeal for the release of those Jesuits. One of the kidnapped priests, Father Francisco Jalix, has himself denied the allegations, saying, quote, the fact is, Orlando Urio and I were not denounced by Father Bergoglio. He did a lot of things behind the scenes, undercover, to try to help people. One story where he gave his clothing and his ID to someone who is uh, being chased by the military so that guy could get across the border and out of the country. He was basically trying to help people from a humanitarian standpoint. So this is the doc some, a section of the documentary about uh, Francis Pope from the New World that'll be on tonight on EWTN at 9.30 Eastern time. And that sort of pulls together, that pulls together a lot of important information about him. But, um, you know, there's the, the other quality that you bring out, that he is willing to criticize the government or, or just to speak for Catholic morality. It's nothing to criticize the government, but speaks for Catholic morality, no matter what. And he got into trouble with the present president, uh, you know, uh, because he stood against gay marriage, immobilized folks, and against legalizing abortion. So this has been uh, something uh, going. This is Nestor Kirchner and his wife is now the president. Yes, her, her Christina, name is Christina. 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 Yes, Christina Kirchner. Um, and you also have a great scene where he still receives them uh, at the Vatican. Tell us about that. Well, he is obviously a very forgiving person, a very Christian person, despite the fact that uh, there there was a lot of tension with the current government. They they made really incredible accusations about him. Um, calling him the incarnation of the Inquisition and yes, saying he was returning yes. Argentina to the Dark Ages because of his position on Catholic uh, teaching on moral issues. The president evidently refused to see him close to a dozen times, you know, was, was very dismissive of him in Argentina. When he became... She called him the head of the opposition? She did. Yeah. The, leader, the leader of the opposition. Uh, <laughs> he, he was declared the leader of the opposition by the president of Argentina. Um, and yet, when he's elected pope and the president of Argentina asks for a meeting, he gives her his first sort of formal state meeting and spends a couple of hours with her in, in a very nice fashion, really showing that, that Christian forgiveness and that reconciliation, exactly. being a great witness to that. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's going to be, you know, I, I said earlier the, the, the comment from, uh, uh, Bernard Goldberg uh, about this, that uh, the way the media is trying to use him. That same quality of forgiveness was the point of he, a comment that he made on the airplane from uh, Brazil back to Rome in that famous interview. And the question had been about a specific Monsignor who had had accusations against him. And he responded, said, look, if someone repents, and ask God for forgiveness, who am I to judge? And the way that that's taken out of context to mean, oh, that I, I can't judge uh, people with same-sex attraction. That's, that's not at all his message, but it gets lost. And this is important to see the context of him. I, I think there's a danger when people take a pastoral statement politically. 
Exactly. That he, he's speaking as a pastor of souls. And in the same interview, he said, you know, people said, you didn't speak on all these Catholic moral issues here at World Youth Day. This was several questions before. And he said, you're right. I didn't speak about fraud and cheating and lying either because the church's position is well known and clear. Right. There's no, there's no debate about this. Right. So, you know, I think, I think that when people try to read into a pastoral statement, some sort of political agenda, then, then you end up with, with some problems. I think that the key thing with this Pope, with any Pope, is really to listen to what the Pope is saying and apply it to our lives rather than try to apply a political filter to what the Pope is saying and, and try to extrapolate from that some sort of political implication, which in this case, a very pastoral statement gets turned into a political agenda item completely separate from the context of the rest of the interview. The other thing though, and I think this comes, certainly comes out also in the video and in your book. All of that attempt to politicize him about what he says on capitalism, same-sex marriage, or, or homosexuality and so on, all of that uh, you know, obfuscates the reality of his commitment to the poor. He's, he's not an economic theorist, but he cares about the poor as individuals, as people suffering, children who are hungry. And that concern is also, as you show in the video in the book, totally consistent with his whole life. And he wants the church to deal with that. I, 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 I totally agree with that, Father. I, I would say I'm not surprised by the fact that the uh, uh, a significant part of the secular press is basically cannibalizing what the Pope is saying to make it look that he is supporting whatever their political or ideological agendas is. Right. What makes me a little bit uncomfortable and what is at the bottom line of why uh, I team up with, with, with Andrew and the Knights of Columbus in, in doing the documentary or came up with the, with the book is uh, that Catholics, especially those who, who want to be faithful and will be well informed, actually take their vision or their information uh, of what the Pope is quote unquote saying from this secular media. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they get confused, they get outraged. Why is the Pope saying this and saying that? And that's not what the Pope is saying. Exactly. It has been totally cannibalized by the secular press. So. My, my humble suggestion is follow the good, reliable Catholic media like EWTN. Yeah. In, uh, in and look up the statements. Yes. Oftentimes, you know, for instance, I found not only the English translations, but the Italian originals. Yes. And if you know some Italian, you know someone who speaks it, get those and see what he said. And don't let that obscure the fact he wants us to evangelize the poor in act and word. And this is, this is his key, key focus, get out to, to the people who are needing to hear the gospel and be fed and cared for. The elderly, big, you have a big sec section there on the importance of the elderly and the disabled in his mind uh, as a poverty. So, you know, when you look at John Paul II's encyclical Evangelium Vitae, he speaks about end-of-life issues, the elderly. He speaks about the people that are disabled. He speaks about the, the people that are seen as burdensome by other people yes, yes. and the need for human dignity in each of these cases. We have a pope here who's experienced a kind of grinding poverty that the average American can't even comprehend. No. The, the, having been there in Buenos Aires, if you've been you know, in Mexico or anywhere in Latin America Ooh. or Africa, Haiti, the Caribbean, I mean, there, there are places where, where the poverty is literally mind boggling. Yeah. So the fact that this is a priority for him shouldn't be surprising. This, this is certainly an, an issue that, that he is going to address because he's seen it pastorally. I think that you know, in terms of where people should go for the sources, certainly the Catholic press reliable Catholic sources, very important. Alejandro pointed out to me earlier today that, that news.va had a statement yesterday saying there's a lot of confusion 
about what the Pope is saying. This is the Vatican's news website. And you should consult the original source and the Vatican websites for what he's actually saying. And don't be confused by all of the various rumors or misinterpretations that are out there. So there's, there's very clearly an understanding that people need to go to the source. And if, if you hear something or you see something and you, you want to know what he said, Go to the Vatican's website and look it up. Go to EWTN or Catholic News Agency, look it up. And, you know, it's so amazing to me that uh, some, a group like the New York Times or one of the other uh, big media outlets will make a statement and then it's covered everywhere the same and the reporters don't look it up. You yes, know? and most importantly, Father, they missed what the Pope is saying on a daily basis. They focus on this major uh, once every month or every two weeks statements from the Pope, but they miss what the Pope is saying on a daily basis. Yeah. Just read out what, what you know, EWTN covers or CNA, Catholic News Agency covers on what the Pope says on a daily basis. Right. The, 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 the profoundly spiritual, profoundly loyal to the teachings of the church his constant quotations of the greatest saints and fathers of the church, of the most courageous uh, uh, contemporary uh, Catholics like Romano Guardini or Henri de Lubac, or people that are like stalwarts of, of fidelity to, to Catholicism, that's what the Pope is. Right. And he speaks about the, 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 the uh, power of the devil, the power of temptation, the, the, the dangers of hell, the need of, of a Catholic conversion, the need to follow Jesus, the need to love the church. The, the, Even watching him with the, some of the, Vatican, the audiences in St. Peter's, he says, do you love Jesus? Do you love him? Come on, say it. And, and they, yeah. they get more excited. Yes, yes. But he, he tries to force them to a decision and not just be clapping the Pope, but interacting with them because, again, as with all the people you show, he loves the folks. He loves them because he loves Jesus. And he sees Jesus in them, the lowest, the lowest people. He stops for, as well as the, the big, big shots that come along. This is um, uh, something too that I, I like at the beginning. You talk about how Argentina, you know, in Tierra de Fuego, at the south end, it's like the end of the earth. And he used that as a model from going out to the end points to, to reach out to people. Any comment on that in the last minute or so? Sure, I, I, I think that he, when he came out on the balcony of St. Peter's, he said the Cardinals went to the end of the world to find me, you know, yes. the, the fin del mundo. So the, the idea that, that he is, he, he realizes this, but he talks about the church going out to the peripheries, going out to the edges, going out to the places where people really need to be met. And I think in my own lifetime, we've seen this once before. We saw this with John Paul II yes. flying all over the world, whether it's the mines in Bolivia or places that no Pope had ever visited in Papua Africa. New Guinea. Exa I mean, really, really the, the peripheries. And I think this is a, a thematic uh, importance for the church to, to meet people in places where they might not otherwise be met to really make sure that everyone hears the message, the good news of the gospel, and is given a chance to be attracted to Jesus Christ. We're gonna take a little break, uh, but I wanna give you one more sneak peek of the documentary you'll see later tonight. Uh, this is Argentine Senator Liliana Negre de Alonso reacting to the election of Cardinal Bergoglio as Pope Francis. And we'll take your questions when we come back, so please stay uh, with us after we go to this clip. <laughs> Senator Liliana Negre de Alonso, a longtime supporter of Cardinal Bergoglio during contentious public debates over abortion and same-sex marriage, was addressing the Argentine Senate when news of the new pope arrived. Sí, pido una interrupción. Disculpe, no puedo seguir hablando. Estoy sumamente emocionada. Como católica, como argentina, los católicos del mundo, y les pido disculpas lo que no lo son. Tenemos nuestro nuevo jefe y como argentino me siento 
sumamente orgullosa de un héroe, un mártir, un hombre que ha dado su vida por la iglesia, perseverancia, lealtad. Me pongo de pie simbólicamente ante el nuevo soberano de la iglesia católica, ante el sucesor de Pedro, ante el representante de Cristo en la tierra y se me hincha el corazón de orgullo porque un hermano argentino ha llegado a ocupar el lugar. Gracias, presidente. Muchas gracias, señora. Disculpen esta, no, esta breve favor. interrupción. Muchas gracias. Fue vituperado. Fue he was reviled. Insultado. He was insulted. He was defiled. And as a reward, the Lord put him in that place as the successor of Peter on earth. I went to my office weeping with joy and gave thanks to God because he compensated him. This person who had suffered in the flesh the hours of Calvary. En carne propia, las llagas del Calvario. Thank you and welcome back. Uh, first of all, I want to invite you to come down and join us here at EWTN. Um, today was actually kind of a nice day. It was uh, just needed a windbreaker today, so it's very pleasant. It was sunny, and so come on down, especially if you're a little tired um, at the success global warming had last week or the ending of global warming had last week. It got so cold that you know this was part of the government's. Uh, very successful program to end global warming, but uh, we've got a little bit here, so come on. Uh, contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966, or go to the website www.ewtn.com to give you information about all kind of scheduling of shows and masses, directions to Hansful, places to stay, and as some of the ladies already here, they had some fried green tomatoes. And even though they came from the Carolinas, they found that the Alabama food is pretty good. So come and join us. You ready for some questions? Sure. All right. Let's start off with Father Stanley. Hello, Father Stanley. Father Stanley, you there? Oh, we lost him. I'll try to get him back. Um, well, let's uh, try a question here from our studio audience. Man, why don't you come down over here to the microphone? There you go. And where are you from? I'm from Columbia, South Carolina. I moved there from Florida, Gainesville, Florida. Right, but you're really from Gainesville, aren't you? I was raised there all my life and That's moved right. to South See, Carolina. I, I can tell when they come up here and they say <laughs> I live in Florida. I'm from Florida. No, they're not. I so, know I have a southern accent. Yes, you do. I know that. So but I lived uh, there all my life, and then I've um, moved to Columbia about seven years ago. That's pretty. And I that like way. it better than Gainesville. There you go. Gilmore Hills. Now, um, uh, what, what is your question or comment? Well, I just wanted to comment that I never did think we could get another pope as wonderful as John Paul II but I was so thrilled when they elected this one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he's wonderful. Yes. And here comes another wonderful one. Yeah, good. Do, do y'all have any uh, comments or about things you've heard from other folks uh, along those kind of lines? Well, you know, I think that the, 
the Holy Spirit clearly is at work in the conclave. We believe this as Catholics, and I think, I think we see this, you know, with the election of John Paul II, you, you got this huge intellectual foundation and interpretation of the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. You got this preaching, especially in Eastern Europe and then around the world with all of the traveling he did. You get a continuation of this with Pope Benedict, who continues building this enormous intellectual foundation, who writes extensively about the importance of charity right. and the importance of hope. Right. And then we get Pope Francis, who continues this in another way, who continues this in a very active way, who goes out to the peripheries in, in a different way than say Pope John Paul II did, who talks about charity and who does charity in a very personal way. And so I think in, in each of these periods, we've seen the Holy Spirit really raise up a key leader for the Catholic Church at a key moment. Yeah, and, and, and certainly someone like uh, Pope Benedict, uh, whose sense of charity, faith and hope uh, as themes of his uh, pontificate, uh, also was very concerned about uh, worship and redirecting, you know, so that, you know, worship is dignified. Uh, and, you know, now Pope Francis is the new evangelist, that they, they prepared the way and he's doing a, a type of, you know, uh, getting out there in the street. I think it was you in a conversation we had uh, at dinner once that he likes to use the uh, very Argentinian expression, non volcanar, you know, don't just stand on the balcony. Tell us about that. It, it, the, the, it's, it's definitely a very expression, uh, a very Argentinian expression. Uh, balconear means basically wasting your time on the balcony. You know, where people Instead put of their being in the sun, yes, on the, you know, the, their sun chairs and you just see what is going around and then you be like, a, like the Muppet show, you know, just uh, the two old guys, the two old guys <laughs> like, yeah, 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 you know, you're just whining about it. Instead of becoming actually a main character, protagonist of what is going on, and he says, do not balconear the life, you know, you know go, go down, get involved, get engaged. And I think, uh, just as, as uh, Andrew was saying, the Holy Spirit has a vision of the church that we will never fathom or imagine. But at least we can see some traces of that supernatural logic. You know, What we have now is a, a, a pope that comes from uh, an extremely complicated uh, universal city. And what I mean by a universal city is that the major problems that you see in a 17 million people city like Buenos Aires are see, pretty much... That's another thing people, people don't understand. 17 million colossal, people. Colossal city with all the type of problems that you can see in any other major city in the world. Buenos Only Aires... More. Yes. In, in the... So the problems that you see in Buenos Aires are the challenges that an archbishop will face in, in Lima, in a major city in the Philippines, in Tokyo, in Germany, in New York, in Los Angeles. So here we have a, 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 a archbishop with a pastoral experience that, is a, that allows him to understand a lot of the a pastoral needs of the people and how people needs not only wonderful doctrinal guidance, which we all need, but also some kind of pastoral cues, you know. So when he says, remember, we are one church. There is some diversity among us. There are different a, a, a communities inspired by the Holy Spirit. That variety is something that we, sh we should appreciate. But he doesn't stop there. He continues with a, a with a pastoral challenge and solution. What he says, he ends up that catechesis saying, so please, you Catholics who belong to a specific community or a specific parish, start gossiping about other Catholics. You know, because we 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 all belong what do you mean to by a, gossiping. Well, normally 
if I, you know, belong to this parish that has these specific practices, I will say, have you seen the other par parish, you know, uh, five blocks away? They don't do things the way they do, you know, and I think that they don't dress up as well as we dressed up for mass. You know, we, normally uh, uh, we, we Catholics uh, um, allow ourselves to badmouth other Catholics, not because they are, you know, committing uh, doctrinal errors or anything, is that just because they have a slightly different sensibility that we have in some specific issues. Mm -hmm. So when the Pope calls for, let accept within the unity, a doctrinal unity of the church, the variety, the multiplicity that is a gift from the Holy Spirit. We all agree in theory, yeah. but then he makes it, you know, take flesh in our lives. And that's why he says, don't go around gossiping about other Catholics, come on. I mean, if we do believe in a healthy, reasonable a plurality that enriches the church, a, Jesuits should not be speaking ill of Dominicans, no, and this I, community should not be speaking ill of these other communities. This parish should not be speaking ill of these other. That's not Christian, right. you know. That's, I never tell anti-Dominican jokes. <laughs> uh, let's uh, go to Marianne. Hello, Marianne. Hi, Father Paco. How are you? Fine. Is this Marianne from New York? This is Marianne from New York. Hi. Happy New Year. And to um, you. I just want to say that I think that uh, Pope Francis is a treasure. He walks in the footsteps of Christ, and we were so blessed to have him as our Pope. Uh, but I was just curious uh, for your opinion, your guest opinion, uh, by how much do you think, how do you think that uh, Pope Francis' formation as a Jesuit has influenced his uh, priesthood, his papacy, and the direction he wants to take the church in? And thank you so much for your time. God bless you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Want to address that? Well, I, I would, and you're the Jesuit, so clearly, <laughs> clearly just, we should defer to I'm you. I'm just recording but, what you uh, say. <laughs> I, I think that one thing that's very clear is that he has that Jesuit missionary spirit. This idea of going out to the peripheries, this, this missionary zeal to attract the world to Christ is something that I think one can see in his Jesuit formation. Yeah. And he was not only formed by the Jesuits, but he was a former of Jesuits. He was, he was someone who served as a key person in the, in the formation system of the Jesuits in Argentina and, and was even the provincial for a time. So I think that that's very much a part of who he is. And I think I personally see that most clearly in his missionary zeal. And uh, Father, Father Mitch, you know this better than I do because you are a Jesuit, and you know that in some places, mentioning the Jesuit makes some good Catholics kind of recoil because of some things that have happened with some Jesuits and the way they have, they have distorted the teachings of the church. So sometimes uh, it was not like in the past in which uh, talking about a Jesuit was some kind of seal of, of warranty. But uh, I, I, in, in exactly in the vein of, of, of uh, what Andrew is saying, uh, the, the, the kind of formation that Pope Francis received as a, as a Jesuit was a classic Ignatian formation. He was the son of a extremely faithful, very holy man that was responsible for his formation. Thus, to answer to our uh, a wonderful friend from, from uh, uh, New York. Yes, he's very Jesuit, but, but in, the, in the deep traditional sense of Jesuit being Ignatian. So for him, for example, the sermon of spirits. What is, why are, uh, am I going to do things? Am I being inspired by just my human desires? By the, uh, am I being confused by the devil or I am being inspired by the Holy Spirit? That crucial discernment yes. of spirit that is very Ignatian. Then number two, ad majorem dei gloriam, for the greater glory of, that, of, of God. What I am going to do is not because I want to look good, it's not because I feel I have to do it, it's because this has to be the best way po possible for the greatest glory of God. Mm -hmm. And then the practical resolutions, as you remember, one of the crucial elements of the, of the Ignatian, Ignatian spiritual exercises is you meditate for a long time, but then 
Ignatius was very, very strong in coming up with practical conclusions on how to turn your spiritual life in something that is going to change your life and your apostolate. Right. So that's very, that's very Pope Francis as well. Yes. Thank you. We have um, uh, Father Stanley back on. Hello, Father Stanley. Hello. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Indonesia. Oh, wow. That's far away. Yes. And your question? Hello. Yeah, we, yeah what's your question, Father? My question is that, uh, my question is that uh, Pope Francis is very well known nowadays. Yes. My question is that, is the media using Pope Francis to, um, to uh, persuade people not about uh, Pope Francis and his teaching itself, but for the, for the media itself? Thank you, Father. Do you want to address that? Well, I, I don't know what, I, I don't want to judge anybody's motivations bec and paint with an overly broad brush, but it's, it's clear that what the Pope says isn't always in, interpreted or, or made uh, clear through the various channels that, or the headlines or, or what people are seeing or the context in which things are presented. And I think it gets back to what we were talking about before. If, if people are interested in what this Pope is saying, if they really want to get to know what a wonderful person he is and what the importance of the message he's bringing is, they need to go to the source. Yes. I, but I, I, I totally understand Father's uh, concern about how the, the media is, quote unquote, using Pope Francis. Uh, the thing is, I don't, I don't think they are going to get away with that uh, for, for this simple reason. They are turning, many of the, of, of the secular media are turning and I agree here with, with, uh, with Andrew about not making any judgment about motivations. It may very well be just a huge misunderstanding and ignorance, but let's say that's the case, you know, best case scenario. Uh, they are presenting, they are embracing the Pope because they think they can turn it into their hero. <laughs> but the Pope is his own man. He has shown to be he has his own will, his own project, his own vision of the church. And at one point, he will be saying the kind of things, and he has started already to say sure. things that they don't like. And after they have embraced him so wholeheartedly, turning him into the hero, how are, how are they going to backtrack from that? Yeah. So I, I, I see here an opportunity in which they will probably end up being outsmart, not by the Pope, who is a very smart man, but by the Holy Spirit. No. Yeah. God willing. <laughs> <laughs> Though I've, I've also been amazed at their ability to um, use double speak oh, yeah. from as 1984 had uh, described. So uh, we'll see. That's, again, this is our role. We're trying to present the data. You know, and that's what we intend to do, well, no matter what they do. And I, and I should say that that you know this book and and this documentary were both uh, the the documentary certainly was completed. A little bit was imported from World Youth Day, but the documentary itself was completed in late June, early July, long before World Youth Day, long before people yes. started taking one interpretation or another. Right. When people really didn't know him, and and it was it was the idea of the Knights of Columbus early on with Supreme Knight Carl Anderson to really help people to understand who this Pope was. Yes. I mean, seeing the square that, that first night, seeing, seeing whether you were watching it on TV or there, seeing the sort of silence for a minute while everybody paused to figure out who this man was, and then the Argentine <laughs> pilgrim was ex exploding in cheers and waving the Argentine flags. It was very clear that people needed an introduction to this man. And our, sure. our magazine, Columbia Magazine, has an article this month on the gospel of life in Pope Francis with all of the pro-life quotations of Pope Francis from his time as Archbishop of Buenos Aires to his time as Pope. And of course, he continues just this week with additional statements. I think it's, I think it's important that, that people understand that, you know, we made, we made this, this film before any of these issues had even arisen and yet the answers are the same because the yes. consistency is there. Exactly, exactly. 
We have another caller. Hello, David. Yes. Hi, where are you from? Um, Father, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. And hey, thank you for taking my call. Uh, um, I hope I to be the there. I hope I'm to sorry? be there in uh, uh, Cincinnati to uh, speak in about six weeks. We'll have to be there for it. Good. Um, yes, my question, Father, is I know the Holy Father is going to the Holy Land later on this year. And he is going to be meeting with the patriarch Bartholomew, and they are going to con celebrate mass together. And I wanted to know when was the last time a pope and a patriarch came together to celebrate mass, and is this a step towards unity? Thanks. All right. Do you have any uh, response to that? Well, is a uh, um uh, you probably know that uh, there are some occasions like the Feast of St. Andrew or the Feast of St. Peter in which for many years now and Pope John Paul consolidated that tradition in which uh, authorities for each one of the churches will go and visit the other community, the Orthodox community, Greek Orthodox or the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Roman Catholic Church and there will be the kind of, of concelebration that is permitted considering the slight differences in liturgical traditions. Yeah. So I, I have been a witness of some of those uh, shared celebrations. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely, I think that that's a step towards, uh, towards unity for sure. Yeah. In uh, one time, uh, Pope John Paul was asked about uh, that despite all the efforts to work on unity with, with our brothers, the, the, the Orthodox, the Orthodox Church, there is a still some bad blood that goes back to, you know, many fights that happened uh, a thousand years ago or well, 900 less years ago. Less than that, yeah, yeah, less than that. It, it's, it, it, uh, and some of them less than that. But uh, nevertheless, Pope John Paul was very clear and he says, listen, unity is not going to be a consequence of our own efforts. It's going to be a gift of the Holy Spirit. Right. But if the Holy Spirit doesn't see us working seriously together, there is no reason why he will have to give us that gift. You know, so I think all these efforts are extremely valuable and they are a preparation for the day in which the Holy Spirit is going to actually grant us right. that, that, that desire unity. Yeah, I think that that's right. I think that's right. I have another caller, Roberto in Texas. Uh, yes, Father, um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I have a, I, I would like for somebody to comment about what the Pope meant when he said, I would rather have a hurt church than an infirmed church or a sick church, something like that. Uh, so did the Pope say that, see, uh, we'll have to check to see if he said that. Did the Pope say he'd rather have a hurting church than a happy church? No, uh, no, 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 he didn't uh, say that. No, no he didn't say, uh, uh, but I know what Roberto is, is mentioning because it was, it was one of uh, Cardinal Bergoglio's mantras that he has repeated now as a Holy Father. He said, I would rather have a church that is wounded or hurt, you know, than a, a church that is sick at home. What, 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 what did he mean by this? In yes. Spanish makes a lot of sense. You know, that, that, so Roberto probably heard that in Spanish. Okay. Prefiero una iglesia accidentada, you know, with an accident, with a, uh, uh, rather than una iglesia enferma en casa, sick at home. And he says, listen, why would people remain permanently at home? It's because they, they have some kind of disease. We have, you know, fever, we have agoraphobia, we, we have fears, whatever it is. Sure. Someone that remains permanently at home is someone that is sick. Now, if someone decides to say, I'm going to go out of my home and go out to the world, we know we're going to be exposed to some kind, to some kind of accident. We know that maybe we're hoping tomorrow we're not going to crash our car. But we know that at some point, the likelihood that we will have a car accident somewhere in the next year is a possibility. Right. So 
Pope, Pope Francis, as Cardinal Archbishop of, 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 of uh, uh, Buenos Aires, used this figure of speech many times to encourage Catholics to do what? Listen, it may feel safe to stay in our parish, just knowing one another, reinforcing one another, because we all think the same, we all can say the same. It's much safer to do that, but that's kind of sick. That's, that, that shows a kind of a sick, weak church. So he, so he we wants to take the risk. Go take the risk. It's, it's the parable of the talents. Right. You can bury the talent and, and leave it safely in the ground and it'll be there when you dig it up, or you can invest it and with reward comes risk, but without risk, there's no reward. Yeah. And so he wants a church that is, that is not hiding behind the walls and hiding in the house, but is out there on the front lines ministering to people helping people. And, and if you get hurt, you get hurt, but you yeah. do what you're supposed to do. That's exactly. Right. One of the things that I'm afraid we're supposed to do is come to an end. Uh, thank you both <laughs> for being here, but we've run out of time. Uh, I want to, again, encourage you to see the documentary put out by the Knights of Columbus called Francis, Pope from the New World, as well as get the book Pope Francis from our EWTN catalog. Uh, and that the, the video will be on tonight at 9.30 Eastern times, so adjust your own time. And I'll give you my own blessing. Almighty God bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we can not only bring you these guests, but also make these specials possible uh, because this is your network. But we also need your support. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you.